The people trying to decommission the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant have been hit by setback after setback. They've battled leaks of radioactive water and faced accusations of misconduct. It's lost them a lot of public trust, and now they're trying to win it back. The operator, TEPCO, has created a company dedicated to the decommissioning. The man who has to navigate those challenges spoke to our correspondent, Yoichiro Tateiwa, and he revealed that he's not sure if he can comply with the government's set plan. Naohiro Masuda is in charge of the entire decommissioning process at the Fukushima Daiichi. He brings valuable experience to the job. He has worked as a nuclear engineer for decades. Masuda says radiation in some areas of the crippled reactor buildings is still so high that workers can only stay there for a few minutes. The hardest part of decommissioning the plant will be removing the fuel that's cooled and turned into highly radioactive debris. We have no idea about the debris. We don't know its shape or strength. We have to remove it remotely, from 30 meters above. But we don't have that kind of technology yet. It simply doesn't exist. Experts say workers will have to keep the debris submerged in water to prevent radiation from being released. But Masuda says that's not as easy as it sounds. We still don't know whether it's possible to fill the reactor containers with water. We've found some cracks and holes in the three damaged container vessels but we don't know if we've found them all. If it turns out there are other holes, we might have to look for some other way to remove the debris. The government wants that work to begin in 2020. I asked Masuda how confident he is that he can hit that target. And his answer was surprisingly candid. It's a very big challenge. Honestly speaking, I cannot say it's possible, but I also do not wish to say it's impossible. I also asked Masuda what he needs most for the operation to succeed. That is hard to say, but probably experience. How much radiation exposure can people tolerate? What kind of information do residents in the area need? There is no textbook to teach us what to do. I have to make decisions every step of the way. And I must be honest with you. I cannot promise that I will always make the right decision. Masuda says he wants the help of experts in a variety of fields from all over the world. He says he wants to make every effort to carry out the decades of work efficiently and safely. Yoichiro Tateiwa, NHK World. To the rest of the news. Surprise, surprise! The Trans Pacific Partnership, or TPP as it's more commonly known, is just as bad as everyone said it was. If approved, the TPP, or as I prefer to call it, the Southern Hemisphere Asian Free Trade Agreement, also known as SHAFTA, would create a whole new set of rules regulating the economies of 12 countries on four different continents bordering the Pacific Ocean. 
Unfortunately, because the TPP is being negotiated entirely in secret, we know very little about it. What we do know about it, though, comes from leaks. And the latest of those leaks, released on Wednesday by WikiLeaks, confirms the worst. The treaty's so-called investor state dispute settlement clauses would, according to the documents released by WikiLeaks, let corporations sue countries in international courts, those courts owned and run by corporations, with judges handpicked from corporate law firms. In other words, if a corporation doesn't like a regulation or thinks it'll diminish their profits, even their future profits, they can sue your town, your state, or your federal government over it, possibly even you. And that would gut environmental and financial rules without any input from we the people or our elected representatives in Congress or state houses. Sounds pretty scary, right? You bet. Joining me now for the latest on the TPP, or SHAFTA, is T.J. Helmstetter, Director of Media Relations at the Progressive Change Campaign Committee. T.J., welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Good to be here. So we've got NAFTA, we've got CAFTA, we've got SHAFTA. What, you know, this, this, this leak pretty much confirms the worst rumors we've been hearing. Specifically, what did we learn? Oh, sure. I, I mean, this could... Uh roll back Dodd-Frank protections, it could roll back net neutrality protections, it undermines uh, consumers and workers, and frankly, it undermines democracy with these secretive, you know, corporate tribunals that are outside of our judicial system. Uh, you know, it's, it's shocking, actually, the amount of odious pieces that are in this uh, proposed deal. Uh, and it's no surprise that even without knowing all the details, 75 percent of likely voters oppose free trade deals like the TPP. Uh, and two-thirds of American voters would prefer to see more transparency in trade negotiations than the secretive way that this administration has been conducting negotiations 66%. for the past six years. 66 percent. Yeah. So, uh, and that includes a supermajority of Republicans, Tom. This, this uh, goes across party lines. This is bipartisan. Totally. So, <clears throat> if the majority of Americans, including the majority of Republicans, think this is a terrible idea, why is the president promoting it? Why are the Republicans in Congress promoting it? Why is there a not insignificant handful of Democrats who are promoting it? What the hell's going on here, TJ? You know, it baffles, it baffles me because, like I said, it undermines consumers and workers and democracy, but who does it benefit? Only multinational corporations. You know, this so the answer to the question is one word, money. Right. Sure. Part, pardon my interrupt. You. Sure. No. I mean, this administration has done a lot of great things on a lot of progressive issues. You know, and in fact, in the past few months, uh, President Obama has seen his poll numbers tick up as he's taken big, bold, progressive action on things like net neutrality and education. Uh, you know, and climate change. His poll numbers have ticked up. So it's it's surprising to me that he's pursuing this policy uh, that has such broad opposition. Yeah. Me too. I mean, I, I, I would have thought by now he would have, uh, what's the, evolved. <laughs> you know, it, it worked for him with gay marriage. Why not with TPP and Shafter? Um, there's this group out there called the Progressive Coalition for American Jobs. Now, you know, I thought it was a little over the top when George W. Bush pushed legislation that would ease up on power plant regulations so they could dump more crap in our air, and he called it the Clear Skies Act. Yeah. Ditto with the water, you know, the Clean Water the Act. Forests. But they didn't, yeah, or the forests, you know, the Healthy Forest Act. But they didn't say the Progressive Healthy Forest Act. I mean, what is the progressive, or is it actually a progressive group, the Progressive Coalition for American Jobs yeah. that is promoting the TPP, or am I wrong? Oh, yeah, no, this is a, a great name. Uh, the Progressive Coalition for American Jobs is neither progressive, it's not a coalition and it's not for American jobs. <laughs> this, is, this is a front group, uh, you know, basically being run out of a consulting firm that is staffed by President Obama's former campaign workers, and it's likely being funded by the same multinational companies that want to see TPP passed. Uh, so what, are, what is this group doing and, and how how can or should we be reacting or responding to it? Well, we call it an astroturfing group because right. it's not, you know, really grassroots. It's astroturf. So um, basically what they're going to do is run ads on TV? Is that You know, I don't know. Um, but we, know, we do know that, uh, that they're not made of actual supporters of TPP. Right, right. And uh, so we're just going to have to wait and see how, how, how much they stick their head up before we figure out how to respond. Well, I'd be curious to know where their funding is coming from. That's the first question I would be asking. Well, according to our Supreme Court, you don't have any right to know, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's yeah. Citizens United all. Yeah. It's a, oh, man. Okay, the, the D.C. Sentinel 
uh, a great new uh, website, uh, Sam Sachs, who used to work with me here, still does from time to time, help put this thing together. It's brilliant. Um, according to District Sentinel, companies have been awarded more than $440 million from taxpayers, from taxpayers, under previous investor state settlements. These are basically where companies sue governments associated with U.S. free trade agreements. That would be CAFTA and NAFTA and, and perhaps a few others, WTO, yeah. GATT, whatnot. Um, it, uh, is that, well, you mentioned that that's the sort of thing we can expect. I don't think most Americans know, for example, the story of Dolphin Safe Tuna. They don't, they don't, they don't know the story of the, uh, the funeral homes in Alabama that were sued by the Canadian company, the Dolphin Safe Tuna companies that were sued by the Mexicans, uh, Mexican government, that, that this isn't just something that's brand new. This has been mm -hmm. going on basically since the first Bush administration and arguably, uh, well, arguably since the Reagan. Well, well so the investor state disputes, and, and Senator Elizabeth Warren recently wrote a great um, op-ed in the Washington Post where she said that you know, this is the part of TPP that should be most concerning to everyone, whether you're a progressive, libertarian, or conservative. This is the scariest part uh, because, like I said, it exists outside of the U.S. judicial system or outside of any state's any country's judicial system. Um, this is where investors can take uh, states, meaning nations, countries, to this kind of tribunal run by corporate attorneys who some days are attorneys representing the corporations and other days they're appointed to be the judges in these tribunals uh, for money or to get out of uh, complying with regulations. Now, this system, this um, investor state tribunal system has existed in some form or another since World War II, which some would argue could have made sense maybe because investors were concerned about uh, investing in developing nations with turmoil in their governmental systems. But the fact is now we're talking about, uh, you know, investing in Japan and Australia with some of the, you know, most respected legal systems or in Michigan, the world. Or Wisconsin. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's not, it's not necessary and it's a total uh, grab for more multinational corporate power. Uh, the first 30 years that this tribunal system existed, there were 50 cases brought to it. In the past year alone, that's how many. And we're talking about multinational companies like Eli Lilly taking Canada uh, to the tribunal in order to undermine Canada's drug system. We're talking about Chevron trying to get out of cleaning up the Amazon. Uh, that's what this system that's is being amazing. used for. And imagine if, if uh, American, if the U.S. started suffering under this. Ten seconds. Where can people go? What, the, what can they do? Uh, well, I think they should uh, tell President Obama to uh, follow Elizabeth Warren's lead and stop pursuing TPP because... And, and the best website? Uh, well, boldprogressives.org is, is a great place okay. to learn more. TJ, thanks so much. Thank it's you. Great to see you. Thank you. Always great to see you. Bruce Power, in uh, partnership with our local municipalities and the Medical Officer of Health, we're advancing some new regulatory requirements with respect to pre-distribution uh, of these tablets. Largely they fall into a provincial jurisdiction about whether they should be pre-distributed or not. In Canada they were done uh, different ways depending on the jurisdiction they were in. In New Brunswick, for example, they've been pre-distributed for years. Here in uh, Ontario and uh, in the Concordon uh, area they've been held centrally, uh, mostly at the, at the township. However, CNSC has opted to create a common method across the country and Ontario has accepted the notion of pre distribution and so uh, as operators we're in the process of working both with the province and with the community to pre-distribute the pills. One of the things that's very important in the nuclear industry is how we share information and share best practice. That's between nuclear plants in Canada and between nuclear plants internationally. And that's also something our regulator does is they look at best practice around the world. And so one of the decisions that regulator decided to proceed with was making it a regulatory requirement to have these pre-distributed around facilities. So that's taking in experience from other facilities here in Canada and around the world and they've made that decision for Canada and of course we're doing our bit working with the municipality and the medical officer of health to make those available in the immediate area. Nothing has changed, it's just a different model and it's decided it would be better if people would have them in their homes because in the, in the unlikely event that you needed them, 
would you take time to drive somewhere and get them? It's much better just to have them handy. Potassium iodide is a, basically a salt pill, so you take it, it dissolves. It is completely absorbed into your bloodstream. The thyroid will take all the, thi all the iodine out of it that it can actually possibly use. The rest will be excreted through your kidneys. Basically, our thyroid gland, which is about here in our neck, sends out hormones that moderate our metabolic rate, and it requires iodine for that hormone. So we need to have a small amount of iodine in our diet all the time. It's a salt, so it's like taking too much salt in your soup. I mean, basically, there's no reaction in a healthy person. Every day, especially if you're growing and you're young, you use a fair bit of iodine. What we're doing with a potassium iodide tablet is to block that uptake with a large dose of, of non-radioactive iodine so that if you get exposed to radioactive iodine, you won't absorb it. Because we know if you do absorb radioactive iodine into your gland, eventually your risk of thyroid cancer 20, 30 years down the road becomes higher. Best time to take it is about three hours before the exposure. Best time to take it is about three hours before the exposure. Best time to take it is about three hours before the exposure. Not more than six hours before. However, if the exposure happens, you want to take it as soon as possible after the exposure. If it's longer than 24 hours, it's not useful and you don't need to take it. If it's longer than 24 hours, it's not useful and you don't need to take it. Interestingly as well, it is uh, noted that if you're over age 40, it doesn't actually give you any protection because you're not going to live long enough to develop that kind of cancer. That if you're over age 40, it doesn't actually give you any protection because you're not going to live long enough to develop that kind of cancer. So in partnership with the municipality and the medical officer of health, in the area immediately around the site, which is about 10 kilometers of an area, we'll be pre-distributing these tablets to residents in that area if they choose to accept them. The idea was we gave them a package which we thought would be reasonably safe so kids wouldn't be able to open it too easily and at the same time would be easy to find if you wanted to go looking for it. This is a, a similar to what everyone will be receiving. There's good instructions in it. You have a 65 milligram tablet, 130 milligram, 130 you need for an adult, 65 for adolescents, and then for children there's a recipe of how to dissolve the tablets and give them the appropriate amount for their weight. In the instructions it, it certainly mentions that you only take one a day and taking more than that is not useful. Uh, your body will simply excrete it. It has a 10-year expiry date on it. Now it's a salt so as you know salt in your cupboard doesn't really expire although there is a best before date usually on a package. It probably will have to be renewed in 10 years just because of that. It's very unlikely that anyone will ever need to take potassium iodide to block the radioactive iodine uptake. We don't expect these tablets ever to be required to be used. That's, that's what we do in, in operations. That's why we're heavily regulated by the CNSC. We have some of the safest nuclear plants uh, in the world here in Ontario. We have a can-do design that is second to none. We have a strong regulatory regime. So obviously we're operating our plant safely, but one of the things about safety first is making sure we have an effective emergency preparedness organization. And that, that's what this is all about. So a leak from a nuclear plant of contaminated uh, material to the public is, is highly unlikely and for a number of reasons. First, there, there are many systems which protect the fuel so the fuel doesn't fail. If you don't have a fuel failure, you can't have a leak. On top of that, we have a very robust containment system. So even if we should have a fuel failure, the containment system will control the radiation and keep it intact within the plant. And so between those two systems, it make it highly unlikely that any uh, release will actually occur to the public. The Kandu plant is one of the few plants in the world that has two different ways of shutting the plant down, fast-acting shutdown systems. We call them shutdown system one and shutdown system two. Both of these will independently shut the plant down. They're located in different places, they operate by different means, and they have a different means of creating the shutdown, so they're redundant and diverse in the way that we would talk about it. Every municipality has to have an emergency management uh, plan. It's mandated by the province, so we have to have plans in place for all sorts of disasters. Bruce Power has been instrumental in getting our emergency preparedness up to top level standards. Safety is number one, 
They double checked, triple checked, and reviewed constantly. So I'm quite confident in their safety management and their emergency preparedness. The website that we've launched jointly with the municipalities and other agencies is called BePreparedGreyBruceHuron.com. And that's a site that covers weather-related items, a whole host of emergency preparedness information where people can go to one site. If we look at our experience here in Ontario, we've had decades of safe operations of nuclear plants. We don't expect that to ever be required, but we're making the tools available also for the likely events that could impact the area and have nothing to do with the nuclear facility at all.